Okay, welcome back to my office here at NAU. Um, again, I am really tired <laughs> because I've been teaching since 8.30 this morning. It's now 5 p.m. and I'm tired. So, <clears throat> um, all right, the plan for now is to share my screen with you guys. There we go. That's not what I want you to see. I'm going to go over here to lipids. Cool. Okay, so we're going to talk about lipids here. Um, so the things that you're going to want to be able to know for the exam are what are the four major types of lipids? How do uh, fats help us store energy? What are the difference between unsaturated and saturated fatty acids? Why are phospholipids like the coolest? And why are they so important in cells? Um, what's the basic structure and, and what is the function of steroids? And um, then we'll talk about a specific steroid, meaning cholesterol, and how does that help maintain the plasma membrane's fluidity? Okay, so if we're going to get really, really broad, lipids are hydrophobic. There are, they are scared of water, right? You guys all know that water and oil don't mix. And that's because fatty acids and other lipids are hydrophobic. Um, they're used for long-term energy storage, especially in us animals. Yeah, thanks for that. I don't really actually need that, but here we are. Um, so they're also used in insulation so they can um, cause um, like so in our little example here of our little sea otter guy or whatever he is, um, because if you live in a watery environment where it's cold, you're going to get cold. So you need a little bit, a little bit of fat layer to keep you nice and warm. Um, so that's what uh, is doing that. Um, there are the precursors for many hormones. So um, that's another reason why these lipids are important. And they also keep our plasma membranes nice and fluid because if there's not enough cholesterol <laughs> then it breaks and then the thing that's keeping your cell together is broken and all your cell juice is spilling out and then you're kind of toast so we want to be able to have that be a little bit flexible okie dokie so the four major types of lipids are triglycerides um, these are we better known as fats and oils um, waxes are also fatty acids. These are um, fatty acids that have a little uh, an alcohol functional group uh, attached to them. Um, and then phospholipids are another one of our major four groups. Um, these are fatty acids that have a, a, pho a phosphate group on them. And then um, steroids are kind of this ringed structure, uh, ringed lipids. Okay, um, let's get into them. So triglycerides, this is the first of our four major types of lipids. These have uh, fatty acids, um, these long chains, they usually range from four to 36 uh, carbon atoms in these big long chains. They're usually most commonly, you know, between 12 and 18 carbons long. So their structure is they have this glycerol head. So this is um, three carbons long. Uh, we've got some OH groups hanging off over here. And then our fatty acid, it has our carboxyl acid functional group right here. So boom, there we go. That's why we call it an acid. Um, and then this big long chain of carbons is why we call it a fat. Okay, so now in order to make a triglyceride, we got to hook these two guys up. And so look, if we, here we have this, all the stuff that we need to do a dehydration reaction. All right, so there's the answer to this question. What type of reaction is going to happen to link the fatty acid chain to the glycerol? Well, we've got a nice dehydration reaction going on. Okay, so here's the boop -a -doop -a -doop. Here is the um, here's the OH group that's going to be lost, and then the other hydrogen is going to be lost from there. And then um, so we can actually make 
during these dehyd the building of a triglyceride, we're going to produce one triglyceride and three water molecules um, based on when we do the dehydration reactions in order to hook these dudes up. And so this forms a special kind of bond called an ester bond, but don't worry about that um, for our class. Okay, so, but just notice there that, that that's where the dehydration reaction occurred is to hook these chains up to the glycerol backbone. Okay, so now we kind of hit on fatty acids a little bit, um, but in order to, to make sure that we're understanding what's important for um, bodies, especially since a lot of you guys are interested in going into the medical field, saturated versus unsaturated fats are actually really important for uh, human health and um, health of other things too. So saturated fats are these big long chains of fatty acids that are bonded. All the carbon atoms have just single bonds. So they are saturated, we say, with hydrogens. There's no possible way that this fatty acid could have more hydrogens. It's holding all the hydrogens it possibly can. It is saturated. And you'll notice that it has this very linear structure. And that means that these fatty acids can stack up on top of each other really tightly. And so that causes it to be solid at room temperature. And we give these the kind of the common everyday name of fats. Um, and then this can also lead up to, because it has this kind of flat structure, it can lead up to plaque in arteries and be blocking our blood flow. Um, arteries are very narrow in diameter, and if we put a bunch of crap in there, that makes it even harder for our blood to flow. So we don't want to do that. Um, and then we can contrast this with unsaturated fats, which means that there's at least one double bond in here. And so there's our double bond in this unsaturated fat, right? We could break one of these bonds and throw two more hydrogen atoms in that. If there's only one double bond, we call that a mono unsaturated fat. If there's multiple double bonds, we call that a poly unsaturated fat. Um, so these arrangements can either be in the cis formation or in the trans formation. Okay, so cis, trans, cis, trans. Um, Usually these guys are liquid at room temperature and we'll talk about it more of why in just a second. Um, and so we kind of call these, these tend to be called classified commonly as oils and these can actually help us lower our cholesterol levels. Okay, so in here, we've got a, a cis bond and that causes that fatty acid chain to have a little bit of a bend in it. It's got a little kink to it. All right. Um, and so that means, so if we have these molecules that are kind of bent all funny, they don't really stack up nicely like the, like those linear formations did. Um, and so remember that a cis bond is where the hydrogen atoms are on the same side as of each other in relationship to the bond. And then a trans is where the hydrogen atoms are on opposite planes. Okay, boop, 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 boop. Cis can be like this, it could be like this. Trans could be like this, it could be like this. Okay, um, so here's some examples of that. You'll see that the, the cis unsaturated fatty acid has that kink in it that prevents it from stacking up nicely. It keeps it liquid at room temperature. Um, and it helps um, prevent that plaque buildup that we talked about in the last slide. What you guys will see is that um, the trans, they have a little bit of a bend, but not nearly as much as that cis bond does. Um, and so 
what the, the problem is, um, why trans fats, you guys have probably heard that trans fats aren't good for you, um, is that the food industry in order to keep, cause like butter, like it kind of can be too hard and then it's hard to spread it on your toast and stuff. But then you also don't want to be trying to spread olive oil on your, on your toast. So you kind of want something that's a little bit in between. It's a little, you know, a little bit soft, but not, not too soft, not too hard. You want the Goldilocks. And so these trans fats actually kind of give us that little bit of that in between of not too hard, not too soft. And what the food industry will do is they'll take oil that's canola oil or um, olive oil, and they'll actually pump hydrogen gas in there. And that what that does um, is that it, it hydrates, it, it adds, it breaks some of those um, double bonds and makes it in from going from unsaturated to saturated. But what it also does is sometimes it switches um, this cis bonding that's good into this trans bonding that actually is bad. And so what trans fats does is it, it heightens the bad cholesterol and lowers the good cholesterol levels in our bodies. And so that's why trans fats are to be avoided. Okay, um, and then we touched on these uh, omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. These are essential fatty acids. Um, and the reason that we call them essential is because our, our bodies lack the cellular machinery in order to produce them. So we have to eat other stuff that has the cellular machinery to make these. Um, so essential fatty acids um, are um omega-6 these are the only two omega-6 and omega-3 okay so let's look at this so we have this is the acid group right this is where we call it the fatty acid part that's that's where that name comes from and let's see here's a double bond and here's a double bond and here's a double bond because there's at least one double bond we know that this is an unsaturated fat and because there's multiple we call it a poly unsaturated fat and it's all bent all funny because of those double bonds. And we can see that these are all in the cis formation because the hydrogens are on the same side of that double bond. So this is a really good one for us. It's called omega-3 because if we go back, you know, go on the opposite end of the acid group and count one carbon, two carbon, three carbons, boom, there's our first double bond. That's why we call it an omega-3 fatty acid um, and it kind of has this weird like horseshoe shape like an omega um, the greek letter okay um so what do fats do um in mammals we have these specialized cells called um, fat cells but they get the fancy science name of um shit um i'm so tired you guys um Ado, fights, atos, whatever, you can read it. Um, that's, those are just fat cells. Okay, in plants, um, we often see, we don't really see fats a lot because they use carbohydrates for their storage. Um, but when we do see them is in seeds um, because seeds, when they first germinate, they actually can't photosynthesize. And so they have to eat um, the stored energy from their mamas um, and so seeds tend to have a higher fat content um, because they're using that energy in order to produce those leaves so they can start doing photosynthesis. Adipose, adipocytes, adipose sites, fat cells. Got it. Okay, waxes. Um, in your textbook, they were like, waxes, I don't know, plants, I guess. Um, but basically, these are long fatty acid chains they're combined with an alcohol functional group. So that's the OH group. Um, this, they're hydrophobic, just like all other lipids, meaning that their water will run off the surface. Um, and so I just kind of wanted to give a little bit more context of why these might be important. So I threw in these pictures of some of the high school students that I've been able to work with over the years. One of the things that we got to do with these kids is take them up to um, some field sites that we had on the uh, north rim of the Grand Canyon. 
And so these kids went out and we, we were interested in understanding how southwestern white pines are going to respond to climate change. So this is a southwestern white pines are ecologically and economically important plant and they're being threatened by both climate change and an invasive fungus. So we were like, all right, let's torture these baby plants and see what happens. And then we got a bunch of kids to go out and measure them. Um, and it was a really, these were really fun trips. I really enjoyed working with these kids. Some of the best memories I had was hanging out with these kids measuring baby trees. Okay, but what was neat about that is that we were also able to kind of mirror the same experimental design in the high school courtyard. Um, and so here are some kids at the high school actually measuring these trees that they were growing at the high school. Um, and what was really super duper cool was I was able to work with, um, let's see, a, a 10 or 12 different students over the years um, on their high school senior projects. And so these kids actually got to do their own research. Um, and what uh, these kids, Shauna, Devin, and Robin are doing is looking at um, photographs, a uh, micrograph. So the, look under the microscope, looking at these pine needles. And so what we are seeing here are the pores in the in the leaf surface that allow gas exchange to happen. So carbon dioxide is coming in, so the plant can do photosynthesis, and water is leaving, keeping that pull of the water um, coming out from the soil of the plant and out the leaf and into the atmosphere. And so the, um, the point of having wax on your leaves if you live in a dry environment is to prevent excessive water loss. And so that's what we actually saw on the Southwestern white pine needles um, was that they had these kind of waxy plugs in their, in their stomata to, to prevent water loss. And what was cool about um, the work that Shauna and Devin and Robin did is that we were actually able to get the same results from their little tiny experiment at the, at the high school as what the, the researchers got in the field sites um, at the Grand Canyon. So that was really, that was really exciting. Um, okay, so the other thing that I wanted to point out about these little stomata and the wax in the stomata is that that can actually be a specialized habitat for certain kinds of fungi. So here is a paper that my partner uh, wrote when he was doing his PhD. And you can see from these photographs, these micrographs, so this is what the um, eastern white pine looked like under the microscope. You can see there's the stomata. Um, and in pines, they have these little crypts. So the stomata are down here at the bottom. And so then there's all this stuff here and it's full of wax. And so he was looking for fungi that live inside the pine needle, but he kept finding in the stomatal crypts in these little chambers, all of these things that looked like fungi. And so here was a thing that like nobody knew existed. Nobody was looking for. It was totally unexpected. Um, and we assumed that they must have been eating the wax. And that's really cool. Um, so what, what wax can do is prevent water loss and provide protection from microbes. Okay. All right, our next class. So this is class number three, phospholipids. These guys are the coolest biomolecules in my opinion. I think they're so rad. I love them so much. Okay, so this is what phospholipids are the primary component of our plasma membranes. This is why we can have an outside inside and an interface. Plasma, membra plasma membranes make up that interface that allows us to regulate and to do all of the live all the cellular processes that living things have to do. Um, so they have a very similar structure to triglycerides, but in one of the spots on that glycerol molecule. So remember there's the three places to hook fatty acid chains to. One of those has a phosphate group. Okay, and that's shown up here in this lighter kind of pinky orange. Where's my mouse? Okay, here we go. Um, up here in this pinky orange circle up here. Okay, 
And remember that phosphate groups have a negative charge. And that means that they're going to be hydrophilic, right? They're going to love water because water, remember, has that partial charge. And so um, because this one is charged, water's charged, they're going to want to hang out and they're going to love each other. Um, what we see with the fatty acids, though, um, remember that those are hydrophobic. Oh, my God. I'm so scared of water is so scary so they're going to want to get away from water whereas the hydrophilic phosphate group is going to want to get to water okay um all right so the phosphate group is hydrophilic the fatty acid is hydrophobic so when we get a whole bunch of these little molecules together they kind of form a shape that's similar to this diagram. We have our phospholipid heads, hydrophilic, love it. Our fatty acid tails, hydrophobic, get it away from me. Okay, so let me grab a piece of paper. <clears throat> so this is our, and when we talk about plasma membranes, we're talking about a phospholipid bilayer, right? We have two layers of all of these phospholipid molecules hanging out together. And what will happen, let's say that this little paper right here, let's say that this print side um, is the hydrophilic end. It's, this is the phosphate group, group part of this molecule. And then this uh, other side of the paper is would be the fatty acid tails. So what would happen is that it would be moving around and it would try to get the fatty acids tails all pointing toward each other on the inside and the phospholipid heads toward the outside. And so then everybody would be happy. The hydrophobic tails would be like hanging out together and the phospholipid heads would be hanging out in the water. And then when we get two layers of that, then we get kind of what can start to become a plasma membrane. And then our fourth and final major class of lipids are called sterols. Whoopsie doopsie. Let me change that. That should be steroids. No wonder everybody's confused. Okay, steroids are the weirdos of the lipids, right? These are um, these. So I, all of the lipids that we've looked for have the, had this linear structure, right? These fatty acids. Are these big long chains but in sterol sterols and steroids we kind of see this um this ring shape right and so in these all of our steroids we have four rings that are formed by carbon um and then our ster uh our sterols have that um, alcohol group on them Okay, so these are steroids that have the ox that uh, alcohol group. There we go. So cholesterol is one that we're probably pretty familiar with. Um, that is in our embedded in our plasma membranes to keep everything nice and loose um, instead of being rigid. It's all loosey goosey. Um, other t organisms use other sterols, so like fungi, or we use uh, use argasterol. And so for you guys that are interested in going into medical fields, um, this might be interesting for you. One of the things that makes treating fungal infections really difficult is that animals like us are eukaryotic. Fungi are eukaryotic. So we have a lot of the same chemical pathways and there's not a lot of like, so when we try are trying to make medications, one of the ways that we can do that is to have that medication target a specific pathway that disrupts whatever the thing is that's essential for living. Well, if we uh, disrupt ATP synthesis, then that's going to kill us and the fungus. But we don't want to do that. We only want to kill the fungus. So this pathway of ergosterol formation is one of those ways that we can target um, the, the fungi by with medication only um, um so there we go 
Okay, so what does cholesterol do? Well, cholesterol is produced in the liver. It's the precur precursor for a lot of hormones. It's the precursor for some vitamins. Vitamin D is a good example of that. And it's the precursor for bile salts. Mm, bile salts, that sounds terrible, but that's important for the breakdown, the digestion and the absorption of nutrients from our food. And I've talked about this before. It's important for keeping our plasma membrane fluid so stuff can go in and out of the cell. Okay, um, so here's a little summary of all the things that we've talked about um, as far as carbohydrates and lipids go. Um, if there are any questions that are still remaining, please uh, talk to me. Uh, I'm going to try to make myself be available as much as I can tomorrow. Um, Wednesdays are supposed to be for writing my dissertation, but, but I know that you guys are probably um, a little bit worried about the exam, so I'll try to be checking my Canvas email regularly. Okay, so that's all from me for now. So let me know if you have any questions and I'll see you guys on Thursday.